So, to begin with, you're given a question about fractions. We've asked you to work out what is two and a seventh and one and a quarter. Now, in any kind of fraction question, if you see a mixed fraction like this, with a whole number and then a fraction, you're probably going to want to turn it in improper or a top-heavy fraction. And by that I mean it's like how one and a half could be written as three over two. So how do we do this? Well, your two times your seven gives us 14. And the one that was already there becomes 15 over seven. Same for the other one then. One times the four is four. And the one that was already there is now five. In order to add these fractions together then now, we need something called a common denominator. And that is to say that the two numbers on the bottom are going to be the same as each other. The simplest way to do that would be to times them together. So it becomes 7 times 4 and 4 times 7. So it means on the bottom of each, we'll now have 28. But we can't just do something to the bottom without doing it to the top, because otherwise we'd be changing the value. So it's going to be 15 times 4 as well, and 5 times 7 as well, to give us 60 over 28 and 35 over 28. This now we can just add. It's going to be the same on the bottom, just out of 28, and then 60 and 35 will give you an answer of 95 over 28. These types of fractions, but now it's a division rather than addition. But still, as I said before, if we're presented with something like this, the first thing we want to do is make them improper fractions. So, same as before, we'll take our 1 and times it by the 5 to give us 5, and add the 1 that was already there to give us 6 over 5. And the 3 over 4 can actually just stay the same. Now, whereas with addition and indeed subtraction you needed to find a common denominator, that's not an issue with multiplication or division. But what we will probably want to do is actually turn this into a multiplication equation, because trust me, this is so much easier when you're working. How we could do this is to flip one of the fractions on its heads, so we could say 4 over 3, and that allows us to turn the division sign into a multiplication. So now we can simply do 6 times 4 is 24, and 5 times 3 is 15. Now this could be simplified, both terms are multiples of 3, so getting rid of that factor of 3 leaves us with 8 over 5. But actually, the original question asked for this in its simplest form. Now, while using improper fractions in your working is, makes it clearer what you're doing, as the name suggests, these are improper. They're not the form that mathematicians really want to use in their final answers. So what we're going to do is turn it back into this form. How do we do that? Well, how many 5s are in 8? There's 1. And from that, there's a remainder of 3, making our answer in its simplest form 1 and 3 fifths. So you're told that there are houses and flats that are in a ratio of 7 to 4, and there are flats and bungalows that are in a ratio of 8 to 5. Given that in this place of residence there are 50 bungalows, how many houses are there? So from the wording it's a ratio question, so let's just start by filling out those ratios once again for ourselves. So houses to flats, we have 7 to 4, and flats to bungalows, we have 8 to 5. Now, in ratio questions like this, it's a safe bet that what they're asking us to do is combine them all into one three-way ratio. But at the moment, while we have flats in both of them, we can't just squish the ratios together because these aren't the same number. Only when they're the same can we do this desired three-way three -way ratio. How are we going to do that? Well, how can we turn a 4 into an 8? Times it by 2. But just like the fractions from the previous question, if you do something to one part of it, you have to do the same to the other. So that means we're also going to do times 2 to the 7 to make it 14 to 8. Now flats are 8 in both ratios. So now we can say that the houses to flats to bungalows is together 14 to 8 to 5. Now we get to the rest of the question. It tells us there are 50 bungalows. Okay, so in our ratio we can say there's 50. How do we turn 5 into 50? Well, we times by 10. And again, if we do something to one side, we have to do it to all the other parts. So 8 becomes 80, and 14 
becomes 140. So if the question then asks again, how many houses are there? Well, for every 50 houses, we can now already see there's going to be 140. It's another wordy question again. We're told that Renee buys five kilograms of sweets uh, for a total of ten pounds, and then she puts them all into bags with 250 grams of sweets in each one, and then she then sells them for 65p. The question then asks us, if she was to sell them all, what would her percentage profits be? Now, the wording here is very important. First of all, we need to identify what it's asking of us ultimately, which is percentage profit. Profit being how much money does she have from what she um, earns by selling the bags versus how much she paid to begin with. It's basically how business works. And the other part though is percentage. We're not just looking for how much more money did she make as in the actual pound value. It's what is that as a percentage of what she paid at the beginning. Okay, now that we understand that, I have to get to the numbers. So again, she bought five kilograms of sweets and then sold them off in batches of 250 grams. Both of these are measurements of how many sweets she has, but they're different units. And in any kind of situation where you have this, different units for the same thing, we want to make them the same. So let's put it all in grams. There's 1,000 grams in a kilogram, so there'll be 5,000 grams in five kilograms. So if we now wanted to work out how many bags she has by splitting them up like this, we could do 5,000 divided by the 250. Okay? Now it's non-calculated paper, so you can't just plug this in, but we can simplify this. So if you wanted, you could eliminate the factor of 10. Now 25 would go into 50 twice, so into 500 it would go 20. So she sells 20 bags. These 20 bags are each sold for 65p. Again, let's say 2 times 65 would be 130. So 20 times would be 1,300p. But you know, we don't talk about money in terms of pence. People would get angry if you tried to sell them in that kind of unit. So we'll put it in pounds. There's 100 pennies in a pound. So that makes this 13 pounds she gets from selling the sweets. Now we can get back to the profit. She just made £13. She spent £10 in the first place, so that gives her a profit, just a profit, of £3. Percentage profit. How we'll work that out is, what did I just say? That was £3 out of the original that was spent, and then times that by 100. So that tells us she made a percentage profit, which is her answer, of 30%. Now, given that this is a non-calculator paper, you may be worried initially if you see numbers like this with decimals in them. But don't worry, we'll get to why this is all okay in a sec. Let's just read through first of all. So it tells us that a cycle race is 3,069.25 miles in length, and that Juan's average speed is 15.12 miles per hour. He'll be cycling for eight hours per day. So, for the first part of the question, Estimate how many days it will take him to finish the race. The key word here, estimate. This is telling us we do not need an exact answer. Now, that's not to say that you can just give any answer. It still needs to be close. But don't worry about exactly working out with the 0.25 or the 0.12. It's asking you to use numbers which are near enough to these values that will get an idea of the right answer. And that they're ones that we can have an easier time with. So let's say that this length here is close enough to... So what we have now is a distance and a speed, and it's asking for time. Now usually you might come across the formula that contains these three as speed is distance over time. Yet we can rearrange this to be time is distance over speed. Okay, so time is distance over speed. So we take our distance, 3,000 miles, and we divide by our speed, which is 15, okay? Now, 15 goes into 30 twice, so add two more zeros onto there, that will be 200 hours, okay? Because it was miles per hour. But he's not going to be cycling for 200 straight hours, so that would be inhumanly possible. He's only cycling for eight hours a day. So, let's try to divide 200 by 
8. Okay, this simplifies to 100 over 4, which would be 50 over 2, which is 25. Yes. Now, in the second part of the question, it then tells us that after training, Juan ch changes his average speed to now be 16.27 miles per hour. So how does this change your answer to part A? Well, there's actually two ways of thinking about this. On the one hand, this is a faster speed, so he's going to finish in a shorter time, so we could expect it maybe to be fewer days. But on the other hand, because this is still that estimating question from before, and we're using numbers which are close to the given ones that we can work with, there's a good chance you would still estimate this at 15, rather than 16.27. Again, this question isn't about getting the perfect answer, the, well, the exact answer, it's about getting one that you can do without a calculator. So, you would actually be perfectly justified to answer both that it would change it, in that it would be a shorter time, or to answer that it wouldn't change it because you'd be rounding to the same figures. So long as you are clear in your justification, you can actually think about this either way. Now with this question, we're starting to bring in shapes. You're given a diagram of a pyramid. So it's got a square base, each of six centimeters. The vertex V is four centimeters above that base. And then the height of the actual slanted slope is five centimeters. Now it gives you an arrow here, telling you a front view, so the way that someone will be looking at this pyramid, and it asks you to draw an accurate front elevation of the pyramid from the direction of the arrow. Now in the question it's going to provide you with a centimetre grid, so you just have to worry about, okay, if it's six centimetres, draw six squares across. So the main issue we're here is just to understand what it's asking when it says a front, uh, a front elevation of the pyramid. View is this way you're facing the triangular face of the pyramid. You can't see around it. So it's actually just going to look like a triangle. And again, with the grid, you can draw it accurately. So you'd be six across this way. And then you would make sure that the triangle is four boxes high, even though the face here has a height of five because the pyramid itself is only four centimetres above the ground. If you're looking at it from the front, it's only going to look to be that height of the four centimetres. The pen may be only this long, but if it's slanted, this is the height you're going to perceive it as. So you're only going to draw a six by four triangle. The next part of the question then asks you to work out the surface area of this pyramid. Not to be confused with the volume, which would be how much of the pyramid there actually is, just simply what's the well, the surface of it, right, if you were to cover it over. You can break this pyramid down, therefore, into the square base and four triangular faces. So, the square, or because it's a square rather than a rectangle, we know if one side has a length of six, and so to the rest. And how do you then work out the area of a square? Side times a side, giving this bit an area of 36. Now, as for the triangle, you want to do half the base times the height. In this case now, we are going to take 5 as our height, because we're just looking at the triangle in isolation. So our base is again 6, our height is 5, so 6 times 5 is 30, half of that is 15. There's 4 triangular faces up, so we're going to times that by 4 to give us 60. So lastly, for the total surface area, the face that's square, Add all the faces that are triangular. 36 add 60 gives us an answer of 96 centimeters squared. This question gives us the following description. A pattern is made of four identical squares that are parallel to the axes, following which it shows you something like this. So here's your four squares, they're lined up. Most are connected by the corner, but these two overlap slightly. It then tells you that down here, A, there's the coordinates 6, 7, and up here B has coordinates 38, 36. And then there's one more point here, the corner of this box, labelled C. And they want you to work out what the coordinates of those points are. So, just add on the numbers that we know on the x-axis. So that's the left-hand numbers here. So you've got a 6 and a 38. 
That means that the distance covered by all four boxes breadths is 32. And since all of these squares are identical, we can work out how wide one box is. And because all the boxes are identical, we can work out the width of one box by taking this 32 and dividing it by four to give us a length of eight. So each of these is going eight along. From this then, we can already work out what the x coordinate of this point C is gonna be. So starting from six, add eight gives us 14, add another eight gives us 22. And as for the y coordinate, if we start up in the corner with the 36, minus eight gives us 28, and minus one more eight gives us 20. We wouldn't have wanted to start from here because we don't know exactly how much overlap there is with this box. But here, coming down, we know it's in that corner. So there we are, the coordinates 22, 20. So next we're presented with a set of axes with a triangle labeled T drawn here and a set of instructions. Shape T is reflected in the line x equals minus one to give R. And then R will be reflected in the line y equals minus two to give us S. And ultimately then it will want us to describe the single transformation of T to S. Now they've given us the axes. It's probably gonna help us a lot to visualize it by actually following through with these instructions. So what do we mean when we say the line x equals minus one? Okay, well, this here is the x-axis, and here is minus one. So the line x equals minus one will be this, because it doesn't matter what the y-coordinate is, x is still minus one. Okay. Now, when we reflect a shape, we're saying that it's gonna go across like this. Each of the points are gonna be the same distance from the line, now just on the other side. So this point here, is two away on the x-axis, y is still at one, so one, two. This point here is one, two, three, four away, one, two, three, four. And this point up here is three away. So that's gonna be here, okay? Can draw it up. And we label it R, just as it says there. Then next, it told us about the line y equals minus two. Similar to what we just did here, only now on the y-axis. Y is minus two is here. So we go across like this on either side. And once more, we're now gonna reflect this across. So now it's the x-coordinates that are gonna stay the same. So x is still minus three, but now this was one, two, three above. So it'll be one, two, three below. This was the same thing, five. And this one here is going to have been one, two, three, four, five away. One, two, three, four, five, all the way down to seven. And now once again, we can fill in our triangle with S. But that wasn't what the question was ultimately asking. This just helps us think about what happened during the transformation. It's asking us what's the single transformation that turns T into S. Well, you can see it's been turned upside down. What might have been the cause of that was to say it was rotated 180 degrees. But through where? If you say in rotation, you need to say what the center was. I didn't rotate it around here. But with these lines, we can actually say the center was that point there. So it, T has been rotated 180 degrees about the point minus one, minus two. That is your single transformation. Question eight then tells us that the perimeter of a right angle triangle, so a triangle that has a 90 degree corner, it, um, the perimeter of that triangle is 72 centimeters. The lengths of its sides also have a ratio of three to four to five. So then want you to work out based on that, what is the area of the triangle? So. If the ratio is three to four to five, we could say then that this has been made up of 12 parts. Three parts here, four parts here, five parts here. So if we want to work out just how many parts each actually has, we can say 72 
divided by that 12, which equals 6. So every one part in this ratio represents 6. So 3 part times 6 is 18, 4 times 6 is 24, and 5 times 6 is 30. And if you want to check that, you can add up 18, 24, and 30 and get back to your original 72. So we know that those are the three side lengths, but which ones are they? Well, in a right angle triangle, this one here that's opposite the right angle, the hypotenuse, this has to be the longest side. So we'll have to label this 30. And then as for the 18 and the 24, that doesn't really matter. They can go either way around. So I could say 18, 24, 18, 24. To work out the area then finally, what we need is half times the base times the height. The base and the height are the ones where we can interchange them. So again, it still doesn't matter. So we can just say, that so from that you have half times 18 times 24 to give you, through a bit of multiplication, 216 centimetres squared. So question nine is about to test our knowledge of how indices work. First of all, we have what is the value of 36 to the power of a half? Well, another way of writing to the power of a half is to say the square root. In fact, if you have anything to the power of a fraction, the denominator tells you what kind of root it is. If it was to a third, I would have done cube root to the four, fourth root and so on. There's just a half, so a square root. And if you know your square numbers, root of 36 is simply six. Okay. Next one, what is the value of 23 to the power of zero? Well, we say that anything to the power of zero, that is to say times itself no times, simply has a value of one. It doesn't matter what it is here, power of zero, means one. Then lastly, the one that's a little more complicated, you have what's the value of 27 to the power of minus 2 over 3? Why are you probably going to want to split this up a little? We can write this instead as 27 to the third to the power of minus 2. Now, as I said above, if something's to the power of a third, that's like saying the cube root. So the cube root of 27 is the, uh, 3. What's 3 to the power of minus 2? Well, again, I could split that up. 3 squared to the power of minus 1, because minus 1 times 2 is minus 2. 3 squared is 9. So lastly, we just have the power of minus 1. A negative power tells us to make this a reciprocal. Or in other words, 1 over that number. So, 27 to the power of minus 2 over 3. Question 10 gives us that the heights of 80 girls are given as follows in this table. So the least height is 133 centimetres, the greatest height is 170. The lower quartile, which is to say the number where 25% of them are beneath it, is 145 centimetres. The upper quartile, where 75% are beneath it, is 157, and the median, which is down the middle, is 151 centimetres. Part A asks us to draw a box plot of this information. So how we do a box plot is to say, we're first, above this axis, going to draw some lines. So the least height is 133. So it's about there. The greatest height at 170. Lower quartile at 145, upper quartile 157, and the median at 151. With the uh, grid it gives you on the paper, you could be a lot more accurate. What we'll then do is create a box between the lower quartile and the upper quartile, covering the median, so it's the box plot. And then you'll make your whiskers on either side, connecting the lower quartile to the least value and the upper quartile to the greatest value. Then for part B, it asks you to estimate, therefore, how many girls are between 133 and 157. Well, as has been said, 133 is the least height. There is no one below that. And 157 is the upper quartile. As I said, upper quartile means that 75% of people are below it. So, how many people are between the lowest possible value and the value which 75% are beneath, well, that's 
that's 75%, or three quarters of the 80. So how many is that? That will be 60. So if we were to look at this shape and its description, it tells us that A and B are two points on a circle. That BC is a tangent to that circle. AOC is a straight line, and that the angle ABO has the value of x degrees. Now it wants us to find angle ACB, so this right here, in terms of x in its simplest form. So this will be using a topic known as circle theorems. For instance, we can use them to say that if BC is indeed a tangent to the circle, O is going to be that circle centre, making OB its radius, radius and the tangent meet at 90 degrees. Because we know that this is a centre to this edge, but that's the radius, as this is also the centre to the edge, AO and OB must also be the same length, making this an isosceles triangle. That is, that two lengths are the same, and so two angles are the same. So if this is x, this is going to be x as well. And since the angles in a triangle add up to 180, if this is x and this is x, then the remaining angle here must be 180 minus 2x. Now, as has been said, AOC is a straight line. Just as the angles in a triangle do, the angle on a straight line is also 180 degrees. So given that this is 180 minus 2x, I could deduce that this remaining angle here for the straight line is 2x, because 180 minus 2x add 2x, they cancel, leaving us with that full 180. Now we've just got one last angle to work out for our answer. In this triangle, we've got a 2x here and a 90 here. So we can have 180 minus that 90 minus that 2x. That simplifies to 90 minus 2x. So now we've come to a proof question, and these sorts of questions are just asking you to rewrite what they've given you in a way that it demonstrates a certain property. The one we have here is to prove that the square of an odd number is always one more than the multiple of four. So because we want to prove it that this is always the case, we're not going to use a specific odd number. I'm not going to try it with three or seven. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a term n. This is what we just like to use for unknowns in this case. But you can't prove that n is odd. n could be two, for all we know. So what I'm actually going to do first of all is make it even. I can guarantee that something's even by timesing it by two, because e an even number, it's a multiple of two. But then what do we know about odds? They're one either side of an even. So if we can guarantee that this is even, then this expression has to be odd. In any question that's about proof that involves odd numbers, you would either could go straight to this or 2n minus 1. That would work just as well. OK, now that we have this, we can start going about showing what they want. It's talking about the square of an odd. So first, we have to square it. So this would be like our FOIL method if we were expanding brackets in any other case. So 2n times 2n, 4n squared. 2n times 1 2n. 2n times 1 2n. And 1 times 1 is 1. So this is the same as 4n squared plus 4n plus 1. Now this, can we see there's 4s present here? I could try factorising that out. Now, no matter what n is, this means that the whole thing is a multiple of 4. And this means that it's one more than that multiple of 4. We've shown it. Now we get to have some fun with thirds. Thirds being some irrational square roots. So it was given us, to us that root 5 times root 8 plus root 18 can be written in the form of a times root 10, where a is an integer that being a whole number. So it wants us to find what this value of a would be. 
So first of all, we're going to want to play around with these thirds to get them in the form of root 10 in the first place. What we can do to simplify thirds is to say, for instance, root 8 is the same as root of 4 times 2, which could be split up as root 4 times root 2. Now, what's the square root of 4? It's 2. So root 8 is equal to 2 root 2. Now let's do the same to root 18. This can be written as 3, that's a 9 times 2. And so root 9 is then that 3. So whenever you're trying to simplify thirds, you want to find some square number that's already a factor of what the bigger one is. Okay, so this is now rewritten as root 5 times 2 root 2 plus 3 root 2. Because this is both in terms of root 2, we could now add them together to say that that's 5 lots of root 2. And finally, we just need to get rid of, uh, expand out this bracket. Just as here, we could split these up into multiples and split them apart. Now, as we times them together, they'll come back together. So this would be the same as 5, root 5, root 2, which is the same as 5, root times 2, which is now the 10 we were looking for, which also makes this 5 our missing A. So in maths, there are two types of proportionality, both of which are present in this question. Inverse proportional and directly proportional. So to read the rest of it, it says that y is inversely proportional to d squared, and when d is 10, y is 4. And then d is directly proportional to x squared, and when x is 2, d is 24. So based on these, it wants you to find a formula of just y in terms of x in its simplest form, so getting rid of all the d's. Now if we were to say that something is inversely proportional, we could say that y is equal to some unknown constant over d squared. We need to work out what this constant is to proceed, so let's plug in the values we know. When y is 4, d is equal to 10, which squared is 100. So if I was to just times this up to leave us with k, we would get 4 times 10 squared, which is 400. So we can say that y is equal to 400 over d squared. Next, we'll look at d being directly proportional to x squared, whereas inversely proportional meant it was divided by the other thing. Here, because it's directly, or well, times. Again, plug in what numbers we know. So when x is equal to 2, so k times 2 squared, d is 24. So now, because this is a multiplication, We'll divide it over to get k. So 24 divided by 2 squared, which is 4. So that means this k is 6. So now we have two formulas involving y, d, and x, and no other unknowns. To bring these together then, we just need to substitute one into the other. So because we're, this is already in terms of d, I could say that y is equal to 400 over this 6x squared, now squared again. Expand those brackets, you get that that's 36 over x to the 4. And then lastly, because it wants it in the simplest form, we need to just cancel it down a little, so 200 over x to the 4, 100 over 9x to the 4. And there we go. These two in terms of y and x in its simplest form. Now this question is asking us about factorization. So in usually in this case it will be splitting things into two brackets. Now here we have one square number minus another square number. We don't know what they are in this case, but that doesn't matter. Because if you have, generally, a square number minus a square number, 
you can just split that into 1 plus the other times 1 minus the other, the difference of two squares. Now this works because if we were to expand this back out, a times a is the a squared, b times minus b is the minus b squared. Then this, a times minus b is minus ab, b times a is plus ab, and those two cancel, hence why there's no middle term. Okay, so this first part, any two squares minus each other could be simplified into this. Now, hence or otherwise, this phrasing should always tell you to use what you did in the first part. Usually, when questions are split into A and B, you'll probably be doing that anyway, but this is definitely telling you. Look at what you just did. Hence or otherwise, simplify fully x squared plus 4 squared minus x squared minus 2 squared. Now, this once again is 2 squareds minus from each other. They may be a little more complicated than A and B, but that's still what this is. So let's just substitute these phrases into those brackets. So this is now our a, that's x squared plus 4, and then plus the b, so plus x squared minus 2, still a negative even though we're adding the phrase because that's what it is originally. And then this bracket here, a again, x squared plus 4, now minus the b, so it's minus x squared and the minus of a minus now becomes a plus, so plus 2. Let's simplify these brackets first before we try to expand them. So x squared plus x squared, that's 2x squared, and then 4 minus 2, which is plus 2. As for this bracket, x squared minus x squared, these now cancel, leaving us with just 4 add 2, which is 6, which is actually now a lot simpler to expand just 6 times each of these terms. So it'll be 12x squared plus 12. And we're back at it with the ratio questions. So question 16 is telling us that there are only red, blue and purple counters in a bag, and the ratio of red to blue is 3 to 17. Sam then takes a counter out of this bag. The probability that the counter he takes is 0 0.2. So based on this, what is the probability that Sam actually picks out a red. Well, probability. In a given scenario, all the probabilities have to add up to 1. Together, it has to be a combined certainty. So if there's a 0.2 chance of it being purple, the probability of red or blue is 1 minus that 0 0.2, which is 0 0.8, or probably going to be easier based on what happens later, 4 out of 5. Next, let's consider this ratio. Red to blue is 3 to 17, that means there are 20 parts in total. So we could say that of the reds and the purples, 3 out of 20 of them are red. Now, if there's a 4 in 5 chance of it being red or purple, and there's then a 3 out of 20 chance of that lot being red, the probability of red in total would be the two fractions times together, which, for the first question on the paper, we know how to do, just top times top, and bottom times bottom. Now the question doesn't tell you to simplify, so you can leave it at this, that is fine, but if you wanted to, you could always say that that's... 6 out of 50, or 3 out of 25. But that is the probability of getting a red. Now, question 17 compared to some of the others is actually quite short. All it gives us is simplify fully 3x squared minus 8x minus 3, all over 2x squared minus 6x. Now, if you're looking to simplify an algebraic fraction like this, you're probably going to want to factorise. This on the top here is a quadratic. So we should be able to put it into two brackets, especially also since it's a non-calculator paper, it shouldn't be anything complicated. At the front here, it's 3x squared. So whatever's here, half the times together to make that. Because it's not going to be any complicated fractions, we can probably just do 3x here and x here. Now as for the ends, they need times together to make minus 3. Now, there's only really two ways to make 3. You've got 1 times 3, or the other way around. 3 times 1. Let's try it the first way. 
you've got one here, a three here. Three X times the three, as you would do if you were expanding them again, would give us nine X. And one times X gives us one. Nine and one. We can already make an eight out of that. Let's say this is a minus and this is a plus. So minus nine X plus one X, minus nine plus one. That's the minus eight we were looking for. And then just to double check, plus one times minus three. Yeah, minus three. As for the denominator though, that's not a quadratic because there's no single number at the end. So what we're gonna do instead is take out a common factor. Two is present in both and X is present in both. So if you were to take two X out of two X squared, that would just leave you with one more X. And if you were to take two X out of the minus six X, that just leaves you with a three. Oh look, it's a common factor. And because they're multiplied and only because they're multiplied wouldn't work if it was this, add this. We can get rid of them, leaving us with just three X plus one over two X. And that doesn't simplify any further. And question 18 goes something like this. Here is the graph of Y equals sine X from minus 180 through to 180. So this being the sine graph, it's something you may come across in trigonometry to do with sine, cos and tan. But the question is actually asking, on the grid, draw the graph of Y equals sine X minus two outside the brackets for that same interval. Now this means this isn't actually a tr trigonometry question, rather it's about transforming graphs. If you've got a plus or minus something after your original function, this is telling you that the graph is being moved up or down in the y direction. And because it's a minus, we're going to move down. The original sine graph is within the interval of 1 and minus 1. So we're just going to have to draw a few more um, to the scale here. Let's go down to minus 3. So now everything can just drop two points. So 0 goes down to two, minus 2, minus 1 to minus 3, minus 2 here, minus 1 here and minus two here. So now you can just join up your curve, something like that, and you've made your transformation. Question 19, and we're on to the final pages of the paper. So this means the questions are gonna get a little bit trickier, but we can still work through them. So P has coordinates three, four, and Q has coordinates A, B. A line perpendicular to PQ is given by three X plus two Y equals seven. If it's perpendicular, that means it's at a right angle as opposed to parallel. Find an expression for B in terms of A. So, first of all, we've been given this equation. We might as well make use of it. It's probably the most solid bit of information we have. But you may be more familiar with equations for lines being in this form, y equals mx plus c. Let's rearrange that into this form, just so we can work with it a bit better. So we only want the y on the side. So let's move the x over. So that becomes minus three x and then still plus seven. And then again, just want y on its own. So let's divide everything by two. And it has to be everything to keep things consistent. Okay. Now from your y equals mx plus c, your m is your gradient. So this minus three over two here is the gradient of this perpendicular line. It's not the gradient of PQ, however. For perpendicular gradients, we're going to do something called a negative reciprocal. That is to say, one gradient is equal to minus one over the second gradient. So if we take this here, so the gradient we want for PQ, say M PQ, that's equal to minus one over minus three over two. Uh, let's just think of this as minus 1 over 1 divided by minus 3 over 2. And then from question 1, flip this. So then minus 1 times minus 2 is just 2. And then 1 times 3 is 3. Negative reciprocal. We're now going to want to construct an equation for a new line from P. Probably actually want to make some space here. So we know that uh, it's going to be y equals 2 over 3x 
plus c. We still don't know what c is here. But we do know it goes through this point here. So I can replace my y with a 4 and replace my x with a 3. Now, 2 over 3 times 3 times and divide by the 3, they cancel. So you've got 4 is equal to 2 plus c. So c is equal to 2 in turn. So my general equation is y is equal to 2 over 3x plus 2. And now finally, we can just sub in our a and b as x and y. So b is equal to 2 over 3a still plus that 2. It's an expression for b in terms of a. Question 20, the final question. n is an integer such that 3n plus 2 is less than or equal to 14 and 6n over n squared plus 5 is all greater than 1. So to end off with, I want you to find all possible values of n. These are inequalities. We're going to have to work, rearrange them to work out our values of n. Let's deal with this one first. Just as though it was a regular expression, we can move things around the inequality sign. Say so this is a plus 2 here. I can move it over here to get the n more on its own by minusing it. And then if I want to just make n alone, divide by the 3, divide this by 3 as well. So we have n is less than or equal to 4. Pretty straightforward. Now for the other one. 6n over n squared plus 5 greater than 1. This is currently divided by. We don't want a fraction, so let's times it up. Let's say that 6n is greater than 1 times this will just be this. So n squared plus 5. And let's bring it all onto this side. So n squared minus 6n, because it was a plus, plus here, minus over there, plus 5. That's all going to be less than 0. I've got a quadratic. I want to factorise. 2 brackets, n, n. Need to make 5, but minus 6 in the middle. Just say minus 1, minus 5. Minus 1 times minus 5, minus times a minus is a plus. And then minus 1, minus 5, minus 6. So re for regular factorising, our solutions would then be n is 1 and n is 5. But this isn't a regular factorising. This is an inequality. Either it's going to actually be that n is between 1 and 5, or it's on the outsides. There's a couple of ways of working this out. One I think is more straightforward is to say, let's test out this one. Let's pick a number between 1 and 5. Let's say 2. If I was to plug 2 into here, so 2 squared minus 6 times 2 plus 5, so that's 4 minus 12 plus 5. That's going to give us 9 minus 12 is minus 3. That is indeed less than 0. So this condition is indeed true. So we've got n is less than or equal to 4. And n is between 1 and 5. What would be an expression that encompasses both of these then? Well, that would be that n is greater than 1 or less than or equal to 4. The 5 is, doesn't need to be taken care of because it's already greater uh, great than 4. What are all the possible values then? It told us that n was an integer, so again that means it's a whole number. What whole numbers fit this description? It doesn't equal 1, it's just greater than, so I'm not going to say 1. You've then got 2, 3, and because it is less than or equal to, we'll say 4 as well. And those three digits are how you wrap up this paper.